morning to our online congregation, and I welcome those of you who are new. Good morning to everyone who's here with us in person. Before we get started on today's message, um, I wanted to give Sister Janet a shout out. Thank you for the sweet letter, uh, the note that you included when you, when you wrote into the church. And I just want to say you're a blessing to us just knowing you're out there and uh, when you guys communicate with us and let us know how the Lord is moving and touching you and, and working through the messages that are brought forth. And, and you guys are such a blessing. You know, this is an online ministry. And so our congregation is spread out all over this world. Um, Sister Janet is in Illinois. And so God bless you, Sister Janet. Thanks for writing in. And I also wanted to share, she said on her envelope, all things are beautiful for those who have God. That's true. And I wanted to share, uh, Sister Patricia, what she wrote on her envelope. Now, she's on our prayer team, and this is what she shared. Romans 8, for they that are after the flesh do mind the flesh, the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, that's like worldly minded, more stuff, more money, more fame, more this, more that, Jesus can wait. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. She shared John 4, 23, but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. And she, she put on here, Seek the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth in spirit and truth. All else will fade away. And that is true. Everything else isn't going to last. Jesus is the one who lasts. And he, he is going to outlast it all. So that's the, he's the one you need to seek and get familiar with and come to and love and worship and serve, right? So thanks for writing and on that on your envelope, Sister Patricia. God bless you and your family. Now I want to give um, also a quick outreach update on India. Um, um, Pastor Dauber had written to me, uh, got this message actually yesterday. So by the time you guys see it, it'll be a week later. He was asking all of us to be praying because they are receiving a lot of rain there. I'm not sure if this is still the monsoon season for them there in India, in the Himalayan mountains. They said they are receiving a lot of rain, and he said they are having many landslides. So the mudslides, the mountains, the rocks, everything sliding down. He said Surav has been uh, stuck in the road. He was coming back home from the village. He was out ministering in the villages, coming back home, and he said, and he's stuck out there, said, don't know how long it's going to take to get the road opened again. So please pray for the ministry work and also that God keeps every member of our ministry safe because of the landslide. Give my love and regards to our family there and to all of Three Hearts Church congregation with pa uh, Christ love, Pastor Dauber singing family. Um, now, I want to show you this picture that he shared. Look at this, you guys. Now, um, that looks pretty scary to me, and uh, my heart sank at first because I thought that was the Jeep that, you know, we had with God's, you know, help and all of you guys helping. We were able to get Pastor and his family that Jeep to be able to do the ministry work there. And, I, and my heart sank for a minute, but then I was looking and I'm like, well, that's not their Jeep. This is an older, you know, model Jeep. But still, so scary. Whoever, whoever was trying to make it through there and the mudslides and the rocks are coming down and the road is going, it's washed out. And you can see the people back there waiting to see, you know, what's, what's, it's not safe. And so it's going to take some time to get the road cleared and to uh, feel like you could travel through there again. So I told Pastor to please let Surav know he's young, right? I said, let's let him know to never, you know, never take a chance. In the end, it's not worth it, you know, when you're driving and you're thinking, you know, can I make it, you know, or can I get across here? It won't take but a second or whatever, you know, and that's all it takes to be going down the side of that mountain. And um, I remember something, I'll share it with y'all, that my mom told me when I was um, young and um, probably my, might have been 19, my early 20s, I know at least. And here where we are in Texas, we don't get much snow 
And when it does snow, our snow is really more like ice. And so there's just a layer of ice and maybe a little bit of snow on top. Most people here in Texas don't know a thing about driving in the ice and the snow. So there are many wrecks and all, and you just watch out. When that happens, you know the roads are fixing to get, you know, clogged up, congested, and everything's going to get backed up because there's going to be all these wrecks and accidents. And so my mom told me one morning, she was like, it's better for you to call in and take the day off than it is. She wasn't even acting like she was concerned about my life or anything, right? She's just thinking about the, the pile-ups from all the accidents. She was saying than it is for you to damage your car, and then there you are having to spend thousands of dollars to try to get your car repaired when you wouldn't have even made, you know, that much that day at work. You know, probably $100 or less back at that time in my life. So mom was like, wait, the consequences here, right? And we don't, we don't think like stuff like that. But I told pastor, first of all, you know, we want Sue Rob and we want all the ministry workers there to be kept safe, right? And then next of all, you know, that is an expensive car that we had purchased and we're still paying on that car, right? To be used to go and do the ministry work. So be praying, pray for the, you know, the ministry workers there because it's, uh, you know, Sue Rav, it's Pastor Dauber and his family, but they have, they have planted 13 house churches. They also have other ministry leaders that help in this work and that move around and go around. So pray for them to be kept safe. Pray for the rain. See, we're praying for rain here in Texas, but they don't need so much rain there where they're at, right? So pray for the rains to subside there, for the roads to be cleared and for the mudslides and what's going on to be stopped. Um, for God to keep them safe in doing all the work that they're doing. And I just wanted to say, too, to please remember Pastor Dauber in your prayers because he is still at home recovering from his hip. You know, they uh, took that socket, that plate, and that chain out from when he had that bad accident back in 2016. Uh, he's recovering from hip replacement surgery. So be praying for him to recover quickly and to heal up nicely and not to have the pain and all of those things, right? And to get back up and running for the Lord. So I just wanted to share that real quick, uh, quick to be, keep that in prayer for them, for their safety, for the rains to subside, the roads to be cleared. And, uh, you know, pray for Sue Rob. He is uh, ministering right now in his father's stead, going out to the villages and, and doing the ministry work. So keep him in prayer too, please. It's okay. We are starting a new teaching series today. This is Soul Ties, part one. We're going to talk about godly soul ties today. And our example, the biggest one I'm going to use, is King David and Jonathan. I will tell you right up front, I did not vet the scriptures in today's message for any Mandela effects, so please forgive me. If I happen to notice anything that really stands out, of course, I'll say something. We're going to read them as they are right now in our Bibles, okay? So let's start out with, and you might be hearing this for the first time, and like a soul tie, what is that? We're going to learn, right? We're going to learn together. So here we go. Uh, this is the online definition. What is a soul tie? A soul tie is a phrase which some people use to refer to a spiritual connection between two people. In many cases, it is said to come into existence after two people have been physically intimate. In others, it is said to form after an intensely close spiritual or emotional relationship. Now, I first want to show you an example of a godly soul tie. These are the kind of soul ties that are a blessing in your life, okay? Just as there are ungodly soul ties, there are godly soul ties, okay? So these are the ones that are a blessing in your life. Oftentimes, God brings the right people into your life to equip you, teach you, strengthen you, to be a blessing and a comfort to you. We want those kind of people in our lives. Let's read about a relationship uh, that is a godly soul tie, exactly what I just was talking about, there is one mentioned in Scripture. And I'm going to hit the main passages, but I encourage you to read the whole story. And to do that, you need to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 
King David is one of my favorite people to read about. This next passage of Scripture is right after King David had killed Goliath. And I do encourage you to go back and read the whole, um, you know, from the time King Saul was anointed all the way through to the end of David's reign. It's so, it's so, it's packed. It's so uh, very interesting. There's nothing, you know, boring about it. And I love to read about King David and King Saul, okay, about that time. So 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. So he took uh, all the things that were on him as the king's son and he equipped and set King David up with all those things, all of his armor, all of his, you know, his... Uh, clothes, his outward clothes, you know, that he had on, and he gave all these things to King David to equip him in the position that he was serving God in. And um, this is when, when it says that he didn't let him go back home anymore. This was King Saul. He kept David there with him. And um, anyway, if you read about it all, you'll know how God put an evil spirit on King Saul because he wasn't uh, obeying God and serving him. And so he took his Holy Spirit away from him and had placed it on King David. And King David was playing music to soothe King Saul from that evil spirit so that it would go away from him. So you have to read, read all of that to get the whole picture of what was really all happening, okay? So, okay, this next passage is when King David knew that King Saul was trying to kill him and he was discussing this with Jonathan, who did not believe it at the time. Jonathan was believing the best about his father. King David was saying, oh, he's trying to take me out. And Jonathan was like, no, he wouldn't do that. You know, I would know if he was King David. like, oh, but he is. So, okay, let's go to 1 Samuel 20, verses 3 and 4. And David swore moreover and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found grace in your eyes. And he says, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then said Jonathan unto David, whatsoever your soul desires, I will even do it for you. They talked about what they would do to signal King David if King Saul was against him. And then they made a covenant together. So they had worked out a little plan, like to kind of do a little test to see if King Saul really was trying to kill King David or not. David had not been anointed. Uh, he had already been anointed, but in the eyes of the people, he wasn't fully king yet because they had King Saul, right? So it was that in-between in stage. So uh, they had made their uh, signals for how they would signal each other if he really was trying to kill King David, okay? And they made a covenant they made another covenant they had several covenants that they had made between each other let's go to first samuel 20 15 through 17 but also you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever this is jonathan talking to king david so he's saying don't cut your kindness off from my house that's his family his seed line forever no not when the lord has cut off the enemies of david every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Now, um, this, uh, so King Saul saw through their plan to find out if he was trying to kill David or not. 
And this is what he said to Jonathan. So the moment got very heated. And he, it was a situation where King David didn't show up to dinner. This was either the second or the third night, and he should have been there. And Jonathan was trying to make excuses for why he wasn't there. And because King David was like, okay, well, if he doesn't get all fired up about it, then we'll know everything's okay. Well, he got really fired up, okay? So they, they had their answer flat out that, yes, he is trying to kill you, okay? Then it's like then it was proven to Jonathan. So beyond a shadow of a doubt, he knew, yeah, he's trying to kill you. Okay, so let's read this. 1 Samuel 20, 30 through 33. He was supposed to be at this dinner. Uh, this was at the time of their feast. Uh, I want to say it was at the new moon. And normally, um, you know, you would be there. And so the first night, King Saul was like, well, he must be unclean. You know, you couldn't participate if you weren't considered clean uh, before the Lord. There were certain things that if you had done these things, you know, you weren't allowed to participate. So he was like, surely he'll be here the next night. And the little excuse that Jonathan offered up, he wasn't buying it. So, okay, all of these things happened. He was just done with it, and he was, he was out for blood, okay? So here we go. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, You son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own confusion and unto the confusion of your father's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives upon the ground, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Wherefore, now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Why shall he be slain? What has he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. He was trying to, to strike his own son down. Yes, he wanted to kill David. And he's like, and I'll get you too while I'm at it. Um, you know, he was just really getting crazier and crazier. He was ate up with jealousy over David, okay? And he saw the writing on the wall. He knew that King David was going to take the kingdom. And he knew his son was going to be out. But that did not bother Jonathan, he was okay with that right from the very start. He even gave his, you know, you would probably say his princely robe. He gave everything to King David. His weapons, his robe, his everything, he gave it over to him. He was fine with that. He knew, okay, that God had touched uh, King David's life, had anointed him, that he was going to rise up and be king. And he wasn't standing in the way of God's plans. Okay? So, um... Here's a rendition of them. And you can see the loyalty that Jonathan had to King David, even at the expense of forfeiting his own chance to reign over Israel. He stood by King David's side. So Jonathan signaled David and then went and spoke with him before they parted way. So they had a little signal to where he would signal him he was hiding out in the field, King David was, until the right time so that they could talk and know what really was going on with King Saul. Was he trying to kill me or not? So they had a little signal. He was going to shoot some arrows, and you can read about that. So now they're going to talk just before they part ways because he can't, he can't stay in the king's house any longer. He's not welcome there, right? Uh, he'd already avoided uh, King Saul throwing spears at him you know, a few times already. He would just get so angry and then he would try to strike him to the wall with a spear. So let's go to 1 Samuel 20, 41 through 42. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times and they kissed one another. This is a godly kiss. This would probably be on the neck or on the cheek, not on the lips and wept one with another until David exceeded. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and you, and between my seed and your seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Now, um... 
This next passage, I believe, is the last time that Jonathan and King David um, saw each other and spoke. Let's go ahead and take a look at that passage. It's in 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 18. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. And you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto you. And that also Saul, my father, knows. And they too made a covenant before the Lord. And David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Now, I always think it's funny that King Saul was chasing King David and trying to kill him and hunt him down and catch him all the time, and yet he couldn't seem to find him out there. And Jonathan went right to him. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a good laugh because it makes King Saul look like such a, you know, a dope. You can't even find him, and Jonathan, your son, goes right to where he's at. Anyway, um, but that was God's protection. That was his hand of protection on King David's life. He was protecting him. If you read about what went on between King Saul trying to hunt him down, you know, God was there protecting King David so many times. Um, but King David and Jonathan, these were godly men. And they made covenants before God, and the covenants they made were godly covenants, as God was their witness. This was a true and right friendship. And that's the best picture of a godly soul tie, you know, that I can think of right there, plain, laid out for us in Scripture. In a godly soul tie, you agree in one spirit, and share a common spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit on Jonathan's life and the Holy Spirit on King David's life. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them at that time. They were both righteous men. Now, King David did have the Holy Spirit on him, but you read about Jonathan, and you can see he was living a righteous life. He wasn't like his father, okay? Um, as I was searching for pictures of King David and Jonathan, of course, these are just renditions, right, of what they may have looked like. And if you look at several of them, they look different. But um, I saw such abominable things online. Uh, I, often in my, when I'm trying to bring forward some pictures for you guys to see, I run across such filth that's out there. You know, and I don't know why I continue to be amazed by it, but... Uh, there are those like T.D. Jakes and others that are trying to pervert what the Bible says and they teach that they were homosexuals or that they were borderline homosexuals. I've brought that out about T.D. Jakes and his teaching about that before. Um, those false teachers are doing the work for the devil. I told Pastor Erastus what they are teaching and this is what he said. He said, this is teaching right from hell, Pastor. That's right. That's right. Uh, they want their evil seeds to take root and grow. They want enough people to hear their teachings. You see, they may teach something else over here correctly, but then they're going to have this kind of a teaching, that King David and Jonathan were homosexuals. You see, they're not going to keep... Satan is not going to have his false teachers not mix their lies in because they are, okay? They want those seeds to take root and grow. They want enough people to hear it. They want enough people to meditate on that and be like, yeah, I can see that, yeah. They want to condition the world to accept homosexuality. And one way is to push this lie that King David, a man, a man after God's own heart, that's what our Bible says. And they have the audacity to go and say he was a homosexual. How could he be after God's own heart if he was a homosexual, which that is an abomination to God? Our scriptures tell us that. I mean, truly. And I tell you, God is really, he is truly going to judge them for that. Uh, they want to take those parts where it says they gave each other a kiss. 
Well, if you're not a godly and a righteous person and you're reading Scripture, you can read anything into Scripture that you want to. You can twist it to fit how you think. If you're not plugged in with the Holy Spirit, you can twist and teach and do and say all kinds of filth and be like, well, see, it says they kissed each other right there. He loved him as his own soul, see? Oh, he, you know, all of these different things. Their souls were knit together by God. It was a godly soul tie. They were close. They loved each other as a man has a best friend, loves his best friend. Um, a godly love, okay? And I, I will say, I, did, I didn't bring that passage forward. There is a passage that says that King David loved him above the love of women, and they, they play that one too because they say, well, King David was like really loved Jonathan, lo loved him more than he did care for women. That is not what that passage is saying either. It was a true, righteous, godly love from a one man to another man, nothing to do with sexual anything. That didn't even enter into the picture at all. They are misconstruing and twisting scriptures to fit their agendas. And I'm going to tell you, they get enough of them teaching that. They get enough of these pictures that I saw that had been drawn up to show them doing things. They get enough of that pushed out there. And after a while, you get people like me shutting up about it. You get the church to shut up about it. And after a while, that's all that's out there. You kissed them, loved him more than women. See these pictures of them kissing. And now they were homosexuals. It's not that hard to get from here to over here. That's their goal. They're going to build it. They're going to keep going. They're going to keep saying this kind of stuff until finally the older ones that know the truth, that serve the Lord in righteousness, die off. Then you're left with this younger generation who wasn't taught God's word, who are having a hard time finding him, and right now they're not seeking him much that I can see. Then they, it's going to be easy for them to believe those lies. And to be like, well, see, well, this guy, T.D. Jakes, was a big, you know, TV preacher, and he had all this big following, and this is what he said. No godly discernment. That is Satan's false minister standing up there in a mega church, and it's totally apostate. So, all right, we'll move on from there. That was a godly friendship. They had godly love between for each other not sexual at all and so much so even king saul said uh when he said the nakedness of your mother i think he said that or your father something i forget let me look father that's talking about his mother and you have to learn uh in the old testament well how all of that played out because that would be his wife that you know king saul's wife that he was intimate with and saw naked and he was saying you're doing this to the nakedness of your father, which was his wife. <laughs> so he could not understand why Jonathan was such close friends with King David, knowing that, you know, King David's going to take it all, and you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, be reign as the next king after me. But he knew, he did not know that death was, you know, right around the corner for him. Jonathan just knew that when King David took his place, and it was, you know, fully recognized as the king of Israel that he was going to have Jonathan at his right hand doing whatever, whether it was heading the military, being an advisor, a counselor, just being his best friend, whatever, he was going to be right there at his side. That he did not know that he was going to be killed in battle. Okay, but David, King David went on and he honored the godly covenants that they made between themselves. And if you read that whole story... Um, you'll know that he kept it, okay? So let's move on from there. That's a godly soul tie. Now, marriages that are equally yoked are another example of a godly soul tie. Some examples of godly soul ties where both people are saved, you have to have both people saved for there to be that godly soul tie, okay? Or spouses, close friends, co-workers, parents and children, the parent to the child, the child to the parent, a pastor and their congregation, the congregation to the pastor, those that they're close with, 
a spiritual mentor and the one that they are mentoring. Those are all examples of where there are godly soul ties. Now, some people got saved after they got married, and that created an unequally yoked relationship because then one is saved and one is not, right? Some people, though, knowingly sinned against God and married an unbeliever. And knowingly means they knew full well that as a Christian, they were not to marry an unbeliever, and they did it anyway. They sinned against God when they formed that union, that marriage, okay? Those people who knew full well they should not marry this unbeliever and did it anyway, they should come before the Lord and acknowledge their sin and ask his forgiveness in sincerity to be sorry and torn up that they forged forward and they did that willful sin against God. Not that they're saying they hate their marriage or their husband or any of that, but that they were sorry that they did that sin against God. Get it right with him. You want to be in a right standing with him. And when you learn these different things that went on, what you should be doing is the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, inside of you will bring that conviction and you, the light will go off and you'll be like, hmm, I sinned against the Lord when I did this or that was a sin. He's pointing out different things through this ministry, through the teaching and the preaching that I'm doing. And when you learn those things, then you need to come before the Lord in prayer in your own intimate time with him and, you know, let him know, Lord, I, can, I know that this was a sin against you, and I'm so sorry that I did that. Please forgive me. But if you're not sorry about it, if you not really, really care less one way or another, don't even bother because he knows that too. And if you're his child, then you should feel that conviction. Otherwise, if you're not feeling any conviction about it, then you aren't saved anyway because you're not saved now. There's no conviction. There's no Holy Spirit. Okay, or you've suppressed, if you started out with him, if you have sin, stayed in sin against God so long, so much, that you have shut the Holy Spirit down time and time again, grieving him because you keep choosing the sin and keep choosing sin no matter how many times he warns you to stop it, stop and clean it up and don't do that, go in a different direction, then he's left. He's only going to be grieved and shut down so much before he's going to say, you know, I'm not wanted here. And he will leave, okay? That's our decision, to choose him or not, okay? We choose Jesus to serve and love and follow him or not. Okay, so, uh, and, and he will forgive you. You know, I don't want anybody to ever get to that place to where they think they have done something so horrible and so terrible that God won't forgive you. If you're really sorry about it and torn up over it, he will forgive you. But it has to be sincere. We can't play games with God. So if you are unequally yoked in your marriage, you uh, do not have a godly soul tie, but all hope is not lost. There's still hope. Right? Let's, let's see. Let's read about some of that hope. 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16. Our hope is Jesus Christ, right? Always. He's, he's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to his return. We're looking forward to being with him in eternity. Okay? But there is hope in Scripture. Let's read this passage. Um, this is Apostle Paul teaching the Corinthians. So he says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman who has a husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the believing husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy." But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether you shall save your husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether you shall save your wife? 
if you have made mistakes, like an ungodly, an unequally yoked marriage, you know, fine, you know better now. You just learned, right? Ask God's forgiveness. And let your light shine for Christ in your marriage. That is, you know, you're not having to ask forgiveness if both of you were not saved. And y'all were just unbelievers and you got married and then you became a believer. You're not having to ask for forgiveness because you didn't know anything about it, right? But the ones who were Christians and knew what God's word said, that a believer is only supposed to marry another believer, those Christians then should feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And now that they have learned, or they knew back then, if they didn't ask forgiveness at any time in their life about that, you should do it now. Clear the air with the Lord, okay? So anyway, go on, you know, let your light shine for Christ in your marriage, whether you're unequally yoked or not, okay? We're all going to let our light shine. Because remember I brought out recently, we always thought that, or some of us did, that the Christian who's in an unbelieving relationship, unequally yoked, that they just kind of stay, you know, muffle or whatever they're like, so to speak, and just kind of go along to get along. And that's not what the Bible's talking about. You're supposed to live full out as a Christian. And if they're okay with staying with you, living fully as a Christian and serving the Lord, fine. But it never said you're supposed to cower down and crawl around and hide your Christianity so y'all can still get along and keep your marriage intact and all of that. That person's never going to come to the Lord if you're living like that, right? How are they going to see and know and get a witness or anything if you're hiding your Christianity from them? That's not how it works. The person who is saved in an unequally yoked marriage is supposed to let their light shine so the other one can come on and come to Jesus and get saved too. That's God's hope. That's how the children get sanctified. That's for the family to get saved. It's okay, um... You know, you just got to move on uh, in your marriage, letting your light shine, move on in God's will, and teach your children not to make the same mistake. We have to teach our children. You know, I, don't, I guess my mom didn't know enough to explain all of that to me and to my brothers um, and really lay that foundation of how it was supposed to go. Um, you know, she was just in a fight. Uh, she was just, you know... With my dad, I mean, he was serving a different God, and it was just a, it was an all-out fight in our household, spiritual one, and many times physical. So, but you want to teach your children not to make that same mistake. You missed it, you missed the mark, you missed God's will from the beginning of that situation. Don't let your children make that mistake, okay? Get in God's word and get busy teaching them God's word, his will, right? So they can seek his plan for their lives. Um, teach them to seek the Lord for the one he has chosen for them and to wait on him. Don't just go out and run out there and marry somebody and, you know, make a big mistake and then mess up your life because you couldn't wait on the Lord to see who he had for you. You want God's best. And he will lead and guide you when you're praying to him and letting him know you know, I, I would like to be married. You know, please show me the one you have for me. Please lead me to them and please lead them to me because they also should be praying on their end because they're going to be a Christian also and they're going to be seeking God also and they are going to be praying those kind of prayers. Lead me to the one you have for me. Show me, Lord. And so he's got, he knows you know who he has over here he knows who he has over here and he knows how to bring them across each other's path okay and i want to i just want to caution you parents out there single or otherwise if it's a husband and a wife parents you know great if it's just a single parent home you know it's to the parents whether you're parenting as the father and the wife you know mom and dad or if you're parenting all by yourself you will answer for if you taught them God's word or not. You're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be judged. And children are a blessing from the Lord. 
They are a major responsibility, and he intended for us to instill his word in their lives and live it out before them. Um, <clears throat> if you're saying to yourself, well, I just really botched it because my children are already grown. They've already left the house. I don't know what I can do now at this point, right? If you're, if you're in that boat, um, you know, first of all, get it right with God. Cry out for his forgiveness because you need to ask forgiveness because you did not teach your children anything about him or his word or any of that stuff, right? Maybe you were an unbeliever, but if you were a believer and you fell down on the job, shame on you. And you need to get it right with the Lord. Make it right with him first of all, okay? And then you do what you can. Um, you sow seeds into their lives. You know, when you see them, you behind the scenes, you pray for their salvation. You pray, over, we're to pray over our children, whether they're saved or not. You be praying for them all the time, okay? Satan's always there trying to tear, tear down our children and get at them any way he can. Keep your children covered in prayer and in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, if your children are, are, you know, gone away from home and they're not saved, you pray and you keep praying for their salvation and don't you stop. Okay, and when you're around them, uh, you sow seeds as you can. You know, you don't, don't argue, don't start a fight, don't get too pushy. Sow seeds as you can, okay, and live a righteous life before them so that they can see and know mom and dad or mom and or dad, either way, loves God and they serve him, okay? And in your prayers for them, pray that God will move their hearts toward him, to him, okay? Now, in closing, we need to be careful about who we make friends with, who we marry, who we learn from, who we listen to, who we are close with in our lives. There are spiritual consequences for all of these things. We want God's blessing on our friendships and on our relationships. We want his blessing in our lives. We want his best to be working and flowing in our lives. We want to guard ourselves from letting any wickedness come in through ungodly relationships. It's very important for us to learn God's ways and study his word and instill it into our children's lives. I cannot stress enough what an important responsibility they are that God has blessed you with. It's important for us to teach our children that sex outside of marriage is wrong. But don't do uh, like my mom did. All, all she did was she just said, you know, don't have sex before you're married. And she did not explain anything about why, anything biblical, anything about God's, uh, you know, the sanctity of marriage and how God set marriage up to be and that both the man and the woman were to be virgins to save their virginity and the why that is or anything there was no godly follow through and all i did was i looked at my mom like well i knew she you know slept with my dad before they got married because you know my brother was right on the heels of their anniversary or whatever and so we could do the math and we knew and so I was just like, well, okay, I don't know why, why you were telling me that. She didn't come through with the follow-through, right? And maybe she didn't know enough and know how to lay that foundation and explain that and, and teach that to me. And they certainly didn't teach it to my brothers. But anyway, um, so don't let that be you, right? Don't fall down on the job as a parent. Explain it to your children and why that is, okay? How come God expects it to be that way? Um, and how their marriage will start off being blessed because of it, because of honoring God, first of all, and keeping his word and doing things the way he said to do it. Um, it's okay. Um, and, of course, that, you know, those relationships, those sexual relationships are reserved for a husband and a wife only. 
And the right way to do it as the child is growing up is they keep their virginity, the, man, the boy and the girl. And then they pray and seek the one that God has chosen for them. And then they come together in marriage, okay? Pray and ask God for godly friends, just like King David and Jonathan were. And if you aren't married and you want to be married one day, seek God about it. Involve God in every aspect and decision of your life. Like I was saying, I think last week, seek Him for all of your major decisions in life. Go to the Lord and ask Him. He will show you. He will lead, guide, and direct you. I remember uh, when we first started paying tithes, when we learned that lesson, and I read uh, chapter 3 in Malachi, and as soon as we started putting that in action, it wasn't like maybe five or six months, Scott lost his job. And I, I know I was just like, um, that's not how it's supposed to be, Lord. You know, you're supposed to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great we can't receive it because we brought all the tithes into the storehouse. And um, so we were praying. You know, praise God, he had severance from that job and so it was just like he was still getting a paycheck while he was looking for another one that was a blessing and so we were praying Lord please show us which job you have for Scott don't let us miss it don't let him take the wrong one show him where you want him to be and it was just amazing uh, all the things that happened in that process and and how God led him to the job that he has now and it's just amazing if you'll just put it in God's hands. He is not going to fail you. He is faithful to his children. He loves us. I mean, he is such a loving father, and he takes care of us. He watches over and protects us. He's not going to fail you, okay? Um, he wants you to have a blessed life and not one that's full of entanglements and problems. When you're in unequally yoked relationships, marriages there's going to be problems there's going to be all kind of problems and that's not god's best that's not what he wanted for you but if you're in an unequally yoked marriage there is hope we read that passage there's hope for your husband for your children to be saved so hold the line and shine your light for jesus christ okay um the rest of this teaching is going to be about ungodly soul ties what they are how you acquire them, and how to break them off and out of your life, okay? Uh, this is something that we need to learn this lesson, okay? There are people caught up in this that don't even realize what it is, what's going on spiritually, and how to deal with it. And for the most part, the church is silent about it, okay? So let's go to prayer, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world, and he is the, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the ones that you have drawn to yourself through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the blood you shed for each and every one of us so that we could be forgiven of our sins and brought back into a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. Thank you for going to that cross and being crucified for us. You are the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world away. And we praise you, dear Lord Jesus. I praise you, dear Heavenly Father. There was no one like you you are all present, all seeing, all knowing. You are amazing, Heavenly Father. You are holy and righteous. I praise you, dear Heavenly Father. I magnify you, Lord. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless us with godly friends and godly relationships. Please help us to take our time in choosing our friends and to wait on you and to seek you, those of us who are wanting to be married, to seek you for who you have chosen for us. 
please help us to grow up in spiritual matters and to understand better the spiritual consequences of our actions. I pray, Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are listening to this message. I pray for those that are in this world that are lost and undone and headed to hell. Heavenly Father, we pray. I pray for their salvation, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would reach out to them once again by the power of your Holy Spirit and draw them to the foot of the cross. We all have family, loved ones, friends, co-workers, classmates, schoolmates, Lord, we pray and for them to be saved, Heavenly Father. We pray for the ones we love and that we know. We want to see them saved and with us in heaven one day, Father. I pray, Heavenly Father, even for the wicked ones in this world, even the ones in the high up powers of positions serving Lucifer, if there are any that are still redeemable, those are the ones I'm lifting up to you, Heavenly Father. I pray, Father, that you would reach out to them one more time. I pray for them to heed your call and to come to Jesus and surrender their lives to him. Heavenly Father, um, Miss Patty was asking for prayer for her and for her sister. I don't know the details, Lord, but you know. You know who she is. You know what the need is in her life and her sister's life, Lord. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, for you to minister to them, to meet the need, whatever it is, Lord. I pray I'm just lifting them up to you, Heavenly Father, and I pray that you would touch their lives, Lord. I pray for whatever it is to be resolved and for them to be strengthened in their faith, to be encouraged, Lord, and to make it through whatever it is that they're facing, Heavenly Father. I lift them up to you. And dear Lord Jesus, as a servant on your altar, I lift my hands towards the congregation and I'm lifting them up and I'm praying for your power to flow out and move and touch and heal them just like the woman with the issue of blood who reached to touch the hem of your garment, Lord Jesus. We're reaching out now to touch you, Lord. I lift them up to you. Everyone who needs a healing is believing and has faith for a healing. They're praying and hoping for someone they know and love to be healed. Lord Jesus, I'm lifting up Three Hearts Church congregation to you. I'm lifting up everyone that's listening right now who's believing for a healing to you. Lord Jesus, I'm lifting up Pastor Erustus. He has been down for a couple of weeks under a spiritual attack, and he's only been able to take in liquids. Lord, the demons have been telling him, why are you planting churches? And they are mad because they haven't been able to kill him, and so they're now telling him they're going to poison him. We don't receive that. I bind that and cast it out in the name of Jesus Christ. I cover Pastor Erustus and Three Hearts Congregation in the blood of Jesus Christ from head to toe, inside and out, in the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord Jesus, we know that you're going to raise him up and strengthen him to go back to doing the ministry work as powerful as ever. We thank you for the great works that you've joined all of us into to be standing there with the ministry in Kenya and Uganda and that great things are happening for God's glory. Lord Jesus, I lift everyone up to you and we're praying and believing for healing. I pray, Lord Jesus, for your healing power to touch them. No matter if they think, well, this is the way it is for me or not. We pray for healing. There's nothing impossible with God. And by Jesus' stripes, the word of God says we are healed and we were healed already. So we're believing for that healing to manifest, Lord Jesus. We're standing on God's word. And as your children, we're believing for our healings to come into our bodies and lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I pray too that you would heal and restore our DNA. We're in such an onslaught down here with the chemtrails and all of the antibiotics pumped into the food and the chemicals sprayed onto the food and GMOs and things they're making in the lab and not even telling us about and all the vaccines that they're pushing and everything that, that they're warring against us with, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would heal and restore our DNA. I pray that you would shut off the nanotechnology from the chemtrails and anything else that's in our bodies that doesn't even belong there. 
I pray that you would shut it down, shut it off, and supernaturally remove it, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will cleanse our bodies. Please cleanse us, Lord Jesus. We want to be whole and pure. We want our systems, our bodies to run the way that you created them to. Help our bodies to heal, Lord Jesus. You made our bodies to heal naturally, but we're seeing more and more sickness and disease because of Satan and the things that he has, he has made to come against us and to tear down our bodies from healing the way that you created them to, Lord. You know all these things. Nothing surprises you. Nothing surprises you. And Lord, I thank you for everyone listening. I thank you for this congregation. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless them and keep them. I pray that you make your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them. I pray that you would lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace, Lord. I pray for your peace to rule and reign in their hearts and lives. I pray, Lord, in this time of crushing with our economy here in America and around the world, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless your children, you would sustain us, Father, that you would provide for us, Lord, that you would help us to make our way and to keep going, Heavenly Father. Please help us, Lord. Um, this has really been putting a crunch on all of us. We've really been taking a, a beat down through this, Lord. Please sustain us and help us, Heavenly Father. Please meet our needs, Lord. Please bless our finances, Heavenly Father. Please help us, Lord, through all of this, Father. I thank you that the gas prices have come down some. We're praying and believing for them to come down dramatically more, Heavenly Father. We're praying for the price on everything, on the food, on cars, on, on the, all the clothes, on the commodity, on everything, Lord. Anything you go to buy, the prices are so jacked up, Heavenly Father. Please bring the prices down. Lord, please help your children through this, Lord. And I pray, Heavenly Father, I continue to pray for rain here in Texas where we are. And all around this world where there's drought, we pray for the rain, Father. Those places need the rain. But Lord, I pray that you would um, stop the rains in India where Pastor Dauber is and the ministry is there, Lord. I pray that you would, those rains would subside, Heavenly Father. We pray for the mudslides and the landslides to stop there, Heavenly Father. We pray for the roads to be cleared. I pray for the roadway to be cleared and safe to travel on, that Surav can make it back home, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would keep all of the ministry workers there and Pastor Dauber and his family there safe, Heavenly Father. We pray for their safety, Lord. And I, I just lift them up to you, Heavenly Father. And I pray a wall of fire around Three Hearts Church congregation, a wall of fire around Pastor Dauber and his family and the ministry workers there. And a wall of fire around Pastor Erustus and his family and all the ministry workers there. I pray a hedge of protection around all of us, Heavenly Father. Just like you had around Job, Father, but I pray that it would not be broken and it would not be lifted, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your protection and your mercy and your grace in our lives. Thank you, Father, that no weapon formed against us will prosper in Jesus' name because we are blood-bought, redeemed children of the Most High and living God. And I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over Three Hearts Church congregation, over the outreach ministries and the pastors and their families, and over all of the leaders that serve under us and all of the disciples who are being made. I cover us all in the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the victory that you died to give us. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We are overcomers in Jesus' name. And I praise you, Heavenly Father, and I give you all the glory and honor for what you're doing in and through this ministry. I thank you, Lord, for those who stand with this ministry, Father, and I pray that you will bless their lives abundantly, Lord. I pray all of these things in the precious and mighty name of Jesus Christ, who is my Savior, Lord, and King. In Jesus' name I pray. Hey, you guys. I just want to take a minute to um, 
let's go through how to pray the prayer of salvation, okay? And why? Why do we even need to pray the prayer of salvation, okay? And also, I'm talking to the people also who maybe walked with the Lord and you went away from him and you just kind of left it behind and you haven't really been walking with Jesus anymore. Um, that's what we call backsliders. I'm talking to both the person who wants to be saved for the first time ever and to the person who's a backslider who wants to come back to Jesus because this ministry does not believe in once saved, always saved. Okay, God does his part and we do our part. It's a team. We work together. All right, so the first thing is you might say, and I hear this a lot, and even my husband was saying it, to be honest with you, before we got truly saved. I'm a good person. You know, I haven't killed anybody. That's kind of the standard these days. As long as you haven't killed anybody, you're a good person. Really, listen to this. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. All of us have sinned. To be honest with you, because the world is in a fallen state, we all are born into sin, okay? And also for the people that think, but I'm a good person. I'm good. I haven't hurt. I don't hurt nobody. I do good things. I help people. That, that person, then uh, there's scripture in Isaiah that says for our righteousness, that's when we're calling ourselves good and we're saying, but we're good. We're good people. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. That's that thing that stinks that you're like, ooh, get it out of the house, right? Filthy rags to him. Okay, and he's the standard. He's the judge, Jesus Christ. And so the thing is, if we don't, if we miss his mark and we don't please him, we're not going to make heaven. So we want to make sure we got our ducks all in a row, right? And uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, now we're not a legalistic church. We know we're under grace, which is what Jesus Christ brought. But there's people that say, you know, like I don't need Jesus. I'm I'm doing the Ten Commandments. Well, if you just pull out the simplest one, I'm just going to pull out one. You shall not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, okay? That's what lying is. And if you say, I, oh, I don't lie, that's a lie. Everybody lies. Little kids come out lying. You say, did you do that? Did you break this? No, not me. Bam. So come on, you know. Um, so here's the thing. We've all broken uh, at least one of the commandments. And in the New Testament, it says if you break one, you broke them all. Because that's the attitude of God. He's like, if you break one, it's just as good as breaking them all because that's all it takes to separate you from him as one. Okay? So let's pray that prayer of salvation. It's real easy to do, y'all. You just say, Dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Please come into my heart. I believe you died on that cross for me, and I believe you rose again, and you are seated at God's right hand. Please help me to live for you all the days of my life. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, that prayer, you prayed to Jesus in his name. The rest of them, you're going to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Okay? And you'll get all that as you learn and grow in the Spirit. Okay? Um, to see why you needed to pray that prayer of salvation, the scripture on that is Romans 10, 9 and 10. That'll show you about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and, and how to obtain salvation in case you're wondering how come we're doing that, okay? Um, now, something that you're going to want to do, you want to right off the bat start establishing your relationship with Jesus. Okay, and in order to do that, you want to hear his voice, right? You want to hear him. I don't know a person out there that's trying to be a Christian that doesn't want to hear his voice. And how you hear his voice, read his word. That's his words written down for you and I to read. That's his voice speaking to you without a shadow of a doubt. Okay, then when you pray, you speak to him. So what's that? That's two-way communication. You're speaking to him. He's speaking to you. Now you've got a relationship going, okay? And you want to do that every day. Every day, seek him. You seek him by reading his word and praying and letting him know, I want more of you. When you read the Bible, ask him to open your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears and to give you understanding. And he'll help you understand his word, okay? He wrote it by Holy Spirit, okay? And the next thing that you're going to want to do is get in a good Bible-based church. 
Now, I'm not pushing any kind of denomination. You just want to find a church that is preaching and teaching the whole Bible. Okay, they believe in the Bible and they believe in Jesus Christ, that he is God and the Son of God, okay, and that it's through him that we have our redemption and our salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life, okay? And also, um, I wanted to say that some people think, oh, I just pray for forgiveness one time and I'm done because he died way back when, so now that I ask, it's all already done. No. You need to ask forgiveness and try to make it a habit on a daily basis because we're in these fleshly bodies before we get our glorified bodies, so we battle this flesh daily. So just, you know, when you pray each day, at some point during the day, say, Lord, please forgive me for all my sins and go on about your prayer. And he knows you're praying and you're talking to him from your heart. And you talk to him just like you and I would talk, okay? You don't have to have fancy whatever, all right? And ask him to help you grow spiritually. If you want to, let us know that you prayed that prayer. It would be such a blessing to hear your testimony, okay? God bless y'all.